Hello, and so nice seeing you again. Good to see you again, Pam. Friday afternoon, all the way from Texas. <laughs> all the way from Driftwood, Texas. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, Marvin is a uh, spring 2018 certified equine assisted coach. I took the training back in spring and, you know, we stayed in contact here and there periodically. And then, of course, life takes over and, you know, the pandemic hits. And then uh, all of a sudden, lo and behold, a couple of weeks ago, I got this email from Marvin that he's now a program director at this Berkey Center for Youth in, in Texas. And uh, he said that he would love to share some of the information. You know, if I would, I, in other words, I asked him to do a video because I would love to capture this on video just to um, show what can happen is if you follow, and I'm not gonna put uh, Marvin's words into my mouth, but he's an example of what can happen is if you follow where your heart takes you, what your calling is, um, you know, whatever your path is. And of course, the main component here is the horses. And I know Marvin has a huge background um, of working with horses. And, um, you know, we'll just stop right there. And I'm going to start asking Marvin some questions. So thank you, Marvin, for doing this video. I really appreciate it and uh, sharing what you do with other people. So thank you very much. It's uh, an honor. Yeah. So what I'd like, how I'd like to start out is how did you learn about equine assisted coaching? And then what is your story? What is your own life experience? Um, and maybe some kind of a challenge that you had and how did the horses help you with that? So what is your experience with horses? Um, you know, how did you learn about equine assisted coaching? What is some challenge that you had and how did the horses help you with that? So let's just start there. Let me, let me start out with a little bit about me. So that maybe that'll put it in context for the viewers, uh, my responses. So I grew up in uh, the eastern part of Texas, the Piney Woods, and uh, I kind of was on the tail end of the use of horses in farming. Uh, I was not old enough to actually uh, drive a team of mules or a team of horses, but I saw it. I was in the fields with them. I've uh, been around horses a long time. Uh, my siblings tell me that I was in, the, my daddy had me in the saddle with him before I could walk. I don't know that's for, for sure, but so I've been around them, but, uh, my family uh, left that area in 1960 and moved to the Texas Gulf Coast. And that was, it was a dramatic change for me because we moved away from nature, moved away from horses. And, uh, but I did go to, I did get an opportunity to work on a large ranch, 12,000 acre ranch and rice farm uh, there on the coast. And they ran uh, 1,500 head of registered Brahma cattle, show, show cattle. Uh, we didn't use horses to work them. We, uh, they, were, they, were, they were so trained. But we did use horses to ride fences and do things like that. And so I was able to maintain some contact with horses. And then after graduating from high school, I, uh, my life wasn't going the right direction. So I decided to join the army and I did that in 1964. And after nearly two years of the army investing a lot of money in me and training me, uh, I ended up in uh, Vietnam as an artillery officer. Um, uh, following my tour there, uh, I, came home and uh, went to work. Uh, I incurred, through com my combat experiences, I uh, incurred what was later diagnosed as PTSD. It wasn't officially diagnosed until 1980. Never went through any therapy. I just kind of, I did like other veterans. I just pushed it down and tried to move on. And uh, of course it doesn't go away. Um, I was in the corporate, in the insurance business uh, for 30 years. Uh, left the corporate world in 1999 because we bought a small place out in the country and had horses again. And I felt drawn in that direction. So I got back with horses and, um, I guess it was in 2010, 2012, 2012, a real good friend of mine who I shared uh, a participation in a men's group, Friday morning men's study group, uh, for years, uh, 
saw me one day and said, uh, we need to talk. And I said, when? He said, right now. We walked off out in the pasture where we were. And he said, I know you do a lot of service work. Uh, I know that you also deal with PTSD. And as a retired counselor, uh, I'm suggesting that you focus your efforts on helping other veterans with PTSD. And uh, I thought, wow, that's kind of unusual. So a little time passed. I began to, to search for a way uh, to do that. Through that process, I met uh, a gentleman by the name of Bobby Farmer who lives here in Dripping Springs. And he's a 23-year veteran, uh, 17 years in special operations, 10 tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. And his story was that he was on the verge of committing suicide, but decided to take another path and find healing. Went through a five-day clinic out in California and for the first time in his life encountered the healing uh, capabilities forces. And then went on and helped establish another center in Virginia. And uh, at the time I met Bobby, there'd been 240 veterans gone through that. It's, it's a pure peer-to-peer -peer combat veteran helping combat veteran. Uh, there had been 240 veterans through that center, um, 90% of them who were suicidal before they got there. Uh, this was like five years later, had 100% survival rate. I thought, wow, mm -hmm. maybe there's mm -hmm. something here horses can do for me. So I began to take a different look at horses. Um, I grew up in the old style, break a horse's spirit, make them obedient to you through their body. Uh, and uh, that all changed for me as I began to work with my horses. Of course, I'd read things about what people were doing, um, even the greats, uh, Ray Hunt. I mean, I remember Ray Hunt in the 70s. We all boohooed Ray Hunt because he didn't know what he was talking about. Well, he did know what he was talking about. So I began to check out these things with my own horses. And sure enough, I found that uh, horses had a whole lot more to offer than just carrying me around from place to place or serving my needs. And uh, so I began to see what I could do with my horses to help uh, veterans. And uh, I looked at a lot of different things. I looked at equine assisted learning. I looked at uh, equine assisted uh, therapy. Uh, I couldn't do therapy because I'd have to go back to school, continue my education. That just was beyond my capabilities. So I looked into equine assisted learning and uh, and, and, and then equine assisted coaching. And after interviewing a couple of other people, I interviewed with you, Pam, uh, on the free interview you offer. And uh, it was apparent to me that you had both the knowledge and experience with horses working with people and had the passion for what horses could do to help us. And, I, and already beginning that to learn that experience was very appealing. And something else that uh, uh, drew me to your path was you said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll help you learn the fundamentals of equine assisted coaching and what it's all about. And then I'll, I will, I will help guide you through taking your own experience and developing your processes and your methodologies. And that's what happened. But those are the reasons that I went with your program uh, versus the other two. Um, and that journey uh, it took me, didn't take me long to tell you about it, but that journey started in 2012. You certified me in 2019 uh, after my practice, uh, after my uh, mm -hmm. equine assisted coaching practicing. And uh, uh, that was a great experience, both the learning and doing the practice work, uh, developing the process and methodology. But that was all focused uh, toward, toward adults and adolescents. And that's where I thought I was going. Of course, I was all set to launch my practice in 2020 and along came COVID. So mm -hmm. that put me on a two year hold. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in 2022, I was set to start again in the spring. Uh, already had the machinery in place. And a friend of mine uh, and neighbor who's done most of the construction work out at uh, the Burke Center for Youth, where I'm currently working, uh, called me one day and he said, you know, I've been talking about taking you out there on a tour for a long time. How about Tuesday afternoon? That's two o'clock. I said, fine. So I met Chuck out there. We toured all the facilities. Then we drove up to the, the, the new barn dominium and Marina, which was still under construction. And, uh, the executive director was there and I realized I'd met him some years back. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, what an unbelievable facility you have back here. 
And he said, yeah, but I'm losing my uh, program director. She's going on an internship with Buck, Buck Graneman in Montana. And mm. uh, I'm not sure she'll come back, but I'm hoping she will. Mm. So about that time, she drove up and got out of her truck. And of course, when two people love who love horses start talking, it becomes mm -hmm. a... You know, mm -hmm. you know how that goes. And so we spent two hours that afternoon visiting about what she did and what her plans were, where she was going, why she wanted to do what she was going to do. And, and she said, you know, I, the only thing I hate is I don't have anybody to take over this program. And I feel like I'm leaving in a lurch here. Well, I came home and, uh, and I believe in a higher power and I believe the higher power uh, is at work all the time and invites us to join in the work and prepares us for it. So I came home and I thought about it and I prayed about it and I called her later that afternoon. And I said, uh, can I meet with you tomorrow morning? So I did. Then I met with the executive director and uh, they offered me the interim position uh, in March of last year, a year ago. And uh, she left on April 12th and I stepped in there. At that time, they were trying to follow the Agala equine assisted therapy model. They mm -hmm. did not have an equine a certified equine assisted therapist who was interested in practicing that. They have an older gentleman who's a contract therapist that comes out on a Friday afternoon and does group therapy. The lady that I filled in for was an EGALA trained equine specialist. But of course, she can't do anything without the therapist except mm -hmm. expose boys to horses, grooming and you know those kind of things. And that's what she was doing. I was very fortunate, very fortunate that at the time I went to work a young, a young lady went to work also as a therapist out there. And uh, she had spent part of her life in a residential treatment center. Uh, she was a victim of developmental trauma. She is a victim of developmental trauma. But she got out of there. She went on and got her education. And she just finished her certification as a therapist. And she helped me immensely to understand developmental trauma or is it sufficiently diagnosed complex P, uh, complex PTSD. Um, and I, I had no idea about this. I had no idea uh, mm -hmm. what neglect and abuse can do to a child, not only in their childhood, but for the rest of their life. And mm -hmm. so through her, I was exposed to uh, the real pros in, in developmental trauma, uh, uh, the, uh, I guess the first book I read was uh, uh, Bruce Perry's uh, The Boy Raised as a Dog. And then uh, I uh, also studied, uh, uh, I'll just look at my notes here, uh, Van uh, uh, Bessel Van, Van der Kolk, who mm -hmm. wrote the book, uh, the bestseller, uh, Body Keep Score. Mm -hmm. She helped me understand all that and she helped me uh, understand really what the boys needed. And uh, I thought, well, they've got therapists here, uh, but they don't have anyone here helping these boys with life skills. And so she and I kind of developed a program that we could get by with. She is a therapist and me as an equine specialist. And she was very interested in equine, becoming an equine therapist. Uh, and what we did was we did equine assisted learning basically with a therapist mm -hmm. present. And mm -hmm. we would split the sessions and uh, we began to see the result right away. I mean, we began to see mm -hmm. the impact that those the horses were having on the boys in terms of relational skills. So she left. It just wasn't a fit for her. She moved on to other things. We still are in contact. Uh, but in September, and so I'm there and I'm kind of like, okay, what do I do? So from August when she left until September, when they offered me the permanent position, when the person I was filling in for decided not to come back, uh, I went to them and I said, you know, I'm not an equine assisted therapist. I don't intend on being one. Uh, but it seems to me like from all I've read and studied, uh, there needs, there's a need here to help these boys develop skills. And the director, the administrator of the therapy program said, you're exactly right. And we don't have anything. And I said, well, the horses can help them. Uh, and so I put together, we'll put together a program. And I did, I put together an equine assisted coaching program for Burke center and, uh, got it approved. 
I said, now you probably need to get this approved by the state. So if they come out here and ask me if I'm doing equine assisted therapy, I can honestly say no to keep myself out of trouble. And if they ask me what I am doing, I'm going to tell them. So I assume they got it approved by the state because we're doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, 20, we have 25 boys out there and I have 23 of them now actively participating on a voluntary basis. When I got there a year ago, there were 10 boys in the program. So the word travels, you know, among, among the boys. Mm -hmm. The boys, uh, our focus is really, the center has two goals. One of them is to help the boys attain self-sufficiency. And the other one is help them develop successful relationship skills or relational skills. And it's mm -hmm. the second one that I really focus on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's kind of the story of how I got the equine assisted coaching, where I thought I was going and, and where I've ended up. And I am a contract employee with the, the Burke Center for Youth, which was established 50 years ago uh, out here mm -hmm. in the country. And uh, at that time, boys were sleeping on the ground and in tents, and, and now mm -hmm. they're living in luxury. So, but these are good boys. They just, they've not had the opportunity for their brains to be developed normally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and thus be able to grow and, and attain and put into practice uh, life skills. Most of them also deal with uh, self-regulation and ability to mm -hmm. self-regulate. Yeah. Uh, there is a, uh, I've never encountered this, but there is obviously a uh, great deal of focus on control there. It's a controlled environment because of the behavioral problems. And we've had boys uh, run away. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had boys get violent enough that the uh, law enforcement agencies had to be called in. The boys range in age from out there, I think probably 11 is the youngest boy. Uh, technically, I think in the state of Texas, it, it ranges from seven to 18. I, would, I think our boys are probably the age of 11 to 17. And most of them are on the younger end of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. They're great to work with. I, I learn more than they do. Uh, but mm -hmm. the horses are great features. And, and really what I've done, Pam, is I've taken what I know about horses and horsemanship, and I put that into the program. Uh, these boys don't know how to trust. They don't know what trust means. This is mm -hmm. what the therapists help me understand. And the first thing we start with, uh, after we've covered safety in our first first session with them as we've covered safety and how we're like the horse and i do that so that they can begin to get comfortable with the horse knowing the horse is not judgmental but but that our priorities and the horse's priorities are the same and uh, safety comfort and leadership and we talk about that and, and relate it to without pointing a finger at them or asking them questions we just stay in the present we only, we only work in the present. We do not go back in the past like the therapists do. The therapists deal with that. Mm -hmm. You don't go mm -hmm. forward because these boys don't have the ability yet to plan. So we stay in the present. And of course, that's where the horse is. So that makes it really nice. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, After we've done those two things uh, and to get them to begin to get their confidence level up in their association with the horse, I show them how to move that horse with the directional aid of a halter and the contact aid of a lead line. And I'm very careful, the therapist said, do not make them feel like that those are for control. I said, well, they're not for control. She said, well, explain that to them. And so I ask each boy how much they think the horse weighs, a thousand pounds, how much do you weigh, 105 pounds? So if you had a pulling contest with this lead rope, who's gonna win? And mm -hmm. they laugh and say, well, the horse would. And I said, that's right. So you have to understand this halter it's not for control, it's for direction. Lead line is for connection. Once we get that down, then I show them how using direction to move the horse forward, backward, and how to move their hindquarters around and how to get them to cross over the front end. Of course, mm -hmm. for most of these boys, I would say all these boys I've worked with, that's a big step because they now are able for the first time in their lives to participate in something as a leader and get response from something bigger than they are. Mm -hmm. It's always before then it's always been the other way in their lives. Most of them, they've been neglected or abused by adults. Yeah. 
And then we move on to what I think is the breakthrough, and it's happened every time. Uh, we've got a 37-year-old mare out there who is the most phenomenal coaching horse I've ever worked with. Uh, when I got there, they said, we don't use her because she's too old. And just one day I tried her and she's perfect. Mm -hmm. But so we we have four steps in our foundational steps in our program. Join up is our horsemanship things. Join up, get the horse to come to you instead of chasing the horse around to catch it. Mm -hmm. uh, connection, respectfully connect with the horse. Mm -hmm. Get the hall grown. Bond with the horse. We do that either by grooming or by touch and breathe. And then partnering. And everything we do, we go through those four steps. Those are foundational steps, everything we do. So once we've got, we got through the leading the horse around, moving the horse on, I, I have a, I tell them, okay, now let's go ahead and lead the horse around a little bit. I just want you to lead around and let the horse try to find its place with you. And you try to find your place with it because again, that's something they've never been able to do. They, they've always been told where their place was. They're still told where their place is. And so we go through that. And un inevitably, I, I see the boy relax because the horse is relaxing. And when I see that, and we're getting toward the end of the first session, I say, it appears that you trust yourself a little bit now and you trust the horse. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, yeah, I feel better. I, I'm... I wasn't sure when I got here, but I feel good now. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want to see if the horse trusts you? And that mm -hmm. stops them because they've never been asked, I don't think, to see if someone trusts them. They just get plowed over. Mm -hmm. And so I say, okay, when I tell you to, I want you to take the halter off the horse. I want you to rub it on the neck, reach under its chin and walk off. And of course, when they do, the horse goes with them. Mm -hmm. And it's the biggest breakthrough imaginable. I know that from my own experience, but to see these boys turn around and grin from ear to ear. And one boy the other day said, that is the coolest thing I've ever experienced in my life. Mm -hmm. So that's the moment of breakthrough. That That's the moment when connection, they get it. Connection is all about relationships. And so then they can't wait to get, when's the next session? And, uh, and then we progress them through uh, uh, directional leading and, and, you know, a lot of different steps. We go through the joint, the, the four foundational steps three times. We do everything three times so they can get that into their system. Mm -hmm. Because learning new information is a challenge for them. And that's one of the things we work on. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we do that. I learned from learning to ski at age 42 that a psychologist friend of mine was with me. And he said, Marvin, I see you're struggling, but if you'll do what I tell you to do for three days on the morning of the third day, you'll be able to ski. Uh, well, I've got nothing to lose. I'm, I'm getting bruised up pretty badly doing it on my own. So I tried it and it worked. And so we do the same thing out there. We take them, everything we do, we do three times. And so uh, we get them through the sessions of whether it's just them and the horse, whether it's directional leading, whatever. Then we take them into an obstacle course. And now we get into them being able to see that their attitude and their ability to adapt to different obstacles transfer, can transfer, to, does transfer to the horse and the horse's ability to adapt. And of course, we relate that to human-human uh, relationships. That our, how we are with the situation dictates or impacts greatly how others are. And of course, we, by this time we've gone through space, horse's space, human space, what that means, We've gone through respect. We've gone through a lot of things, but when we get to that point of adaptation, it, it really, I think, I think it be, you can begin to see it register with them. I think that, and we've done this now <clears throat> over 13 sessions. So we're doing little bitty pieces at a time, which is another thing the therapist convinced me of is speak in simple terms and don't try to cover very much in a session. And don't ask Many don't ask the boys to give you many answers because they, they they consider that to be a test. And it's all about their worthiness then. And they'll tell you whatever they think you want to hear. So just give it to them. So the only thing I ask a boy is at the end of the session, as we've gone through this, and we've talked about how it relates to human-human uh, relations, is I always ask them, what's the takeaway? And they're getting to where now they can tell me that. 
uh, where before they'd say, I don't know. I guess the uh, two biggest breakthroughs I've had since I've been out there, they're, they're all big breakthroughs as far as I'm concerned. And these boys love these horses. They want to help feed the horses. They want to groom the horses. They want to just be, because they've, they've had that feeling that you know and I know what happens when you're in the presence of that horse. And having dealt with challenges of PTSD all my life and not knowing what that what the horse could do, and then finding that out, how it calms me down when I feel a trigger coming on. The boys get yeah. that, and how the horses are non-judgmental. So the, uh, we had, when I went out there, the first got there, the therapist said, there are two boys here that I would love to get into the horse program, but I can't convince either one of them. And we don't, it's not mandatory, it's all volunteer. And so uh, I guess it was in December, so April to December, I was over uh, by the dorm one afternoon. I'd taken one boy back to the dorm and was picking up another one. And this young man came to me, one of those two, and said, uh, and he never would look anybody in the face when you were talking to him or when he was talking to you. And he would give you basically one word answers if you ask him a question. And he said, can I get in the horse program? That's what they called it. And I said, sure, I'd be honored to get you in the horse program. I mean, I was ready to jump up down and shout. Yeah. And uh, we did the same thing I just told you in that first session. And when that horse followed him, it just opened the door to his world. He began talking. He began asking questions. And as we were driving back, he said, you know, I can't wait to get access to a computer. I'm not sure I'm going to do that, but I want to learn everything I can about a horse. So he, he, the horse got, th got through to him when humans couldn't get through to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other boy was 12 years old. I guess he's 13 now. 12 years old, and his residency at that residential treatment center was his 42nd placement. So needless to say, he had pretty well shut the world out. And the therapist said, you know, I can't get him to open up. It's just like a blank piece of paper. And when I was around him, I felt the same way. So she finally got him to come to a session. He was, it was conditional. He could stop at any time he wanted to. So we got through the explanation part and ready to do the exercise. He said, no, I prefer not to do that today. So we took, she took him back. But he told her on the way back, I'd like to come again. And when he came the second time and we got through that, I said, we had a little bit of explanation time. I said, look, I have an exercise for you today and we can go ahead and do that. And he said, you talking about the leadership thing and the leading horse? I said, yes. I said, is there something else you'd rather do? He said, yeah, I'd just like to hang out with a horse and, and brush it. So I gave him a brush and made sure he understood the safety things we'd gone over in that first session. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of occupying ourselves, just giving him time with the horse. And next thing I knew, he was leading that horse around changing directions so and you could see it just he was just opening up because he wasn't told what to do and he figured it out on his own mm -hmm. and i could see the horse completely relaxed with him and this horse is not it's not one that just gets relaxed with you automatically he's a former he's, he's a dual retiree cutting horse and barrel racing horse a uh, money winning horse mm -hmm. and uh i said Kristen, looks like Bud really likes you and trusts you. Uh, I don't know if I can make this happen because I knew of his threat of running away. I don't know if I can make this happen, but if I can, would you be willing to come up here, come up here once in a while and help me take care of Bud? And that just opened his world up. It was just amazing. But again, it was the horse because the therapist and I had backed off to give him space. And uh, so those are the kind of things that we see out there uh, as well as the skill development. And uh, of course, we, I have to evaluate each boy and submit the evaluation. We have a treatment team out there that consists of the therapists, the caseworkers, the therapy administrator, and myself. And uh, uh, I file those online, my evaluations after each session. And uh, I told them when I, when I developed the evaluation uh, tool, I said, you know, this is subjective. And the administrator said, yeah, but the same person is subjective every time. So... They think there's some validity in what I'm putting on there. And 
And then we look at it progressively over time with the boys. And, and I'm hoping that the therapists are taking advantage of that and put it, putting it alongside their notes. I don't know that, but I hope they are. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of the story. I gave it all to you at one time, I think, but. Yeah. Yeah. What a beautiful story. Wow. Yeah. From where you started, you know, in your path and a sequence of things that entered in that path. And then you met this person and, um, you know, and then you met this person and, you know, you've known some people from the past, but you reconnected and then it just continued to take you into what you're doing today. And I think, you know, part of your past too, like you said, you were a veteran and, you know, you were diagnosed with PTSD and that is something you can't learn in a school. You can't learn from books. So you feel it and it's in you. And combining that with the horses, because a lot of times the horses too, we don't know what their history is. You know, they may be feeling some of that too. Who knows? And then bringing the clients in, you know, they have those attachment issues. And then the atmosphere that you're in sounds as if you're in a wonderful atmosphere with administration, you know, and putting this all together and, and developing and growing this program, you know, from the story you're sharing, it speaks volumes um, because the results that these, you know, clients are getting. And if you said like that one boy, he was placed 42 times. Wow. You know, this, this speaks volumes. And what I heard, you know, when you were saying initially you invited him into connecting with one of the horses, which he did, um, and you weren't sure if he was going to come back, but then somewhere along he had time to process and something in there was triggered. He, and then he came back and then you opened up the door by asking him a question. Instead of you're going to do this, you gave him a question where he had to decide. And so he took ownership in that and they gave him an opportunity. And then right from there. So I saw where you gave him that opportunity instead of, I think, like a lot of adults and therapists, too. It can, it can be very rigid. Um, and so, but I think with you working with the horses, not I think, but just listening to you working with the horses and the atmosphere you're working in and then your background, how that all adds into like what got you to where you are today, which is doing this beautiful work. And I feel you're working with one of the toughest, one of the toughest populations there is that you can work with. So um, that's not an easy population. Well, I don't uh, see it that way. They are they're just great when they're with me. But as I tell everybody, I have I have been a disadvantage because I have the horse to intervene, and it really mm -hmm. does make a difference, as you know. I mean, that horse yeah. is. Great. Uh, they yeah. know, those boys know they're in the presence of something that doesn't have a system of beliefs, therefore can't judge them. Even when I tell them that, they know that. Yes. Them. And yes. That, they just feel real comfortable there. Um, the, yeah. One of the things that you said made me think, uh, our focus is on really helping them oh, through a lot of, lot of process here. It's about relation, but you know, they don't even know how to have a relationship with themselves in most cases. So they have to mm -hmm. kind of try to find their identity as they go along. But trusting adults is their biggest challenge. And mm -hmm. so what do we try to do is get them to trust the horse, which comes about fairly quickly, and then transfer that from the horse to the horse and me. Right. And be, hopefully begin to transfer it from me to other human beings, adults. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Struggle is, is that, of necessity, these boys are living in a pretty highly controlled environment. So when I release them back to that environment, there is every possibility because of their lack of ability to self-regulate that they're going to get into a situation where they could be re-traumatized. And so mm -hmm. I know that, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't, you know, the reality, that's the reality of the situation. And one of the things I had to figure out right quick was it, can I find a way to work successfully in that reality? And so I just mm -hmm. focus on those boys and helping them with relational skills 
and focus on the horses and I stay out of everything else. And, and so far it's uh, been very rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. It is very rewarding. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Kudos to you, Marvin, for, um, yeah. Following your, your path, following your tuition, your gut, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, uh, helping, you know, these, these, I call them children, young adults, um, teenagers, um, because yeah, society hasn't taught them, you know, or helped them or been very good role models. Um, yeah, in many ways. So, um, yeah, you pretty much covered all the bases and, um, One of the yeah, you shared some One of the questions stories. you sent me was, uh, what did I get out of your training? Okay, yeah. <laughs> and I want to yeah, what did you get out of training? training? You know, there were eight of us that went through, I think there were eight of us that went through that training uh, at the same yeah. time. And I can recall yeah. those weekly telephone sessions uh, and how much I got from hearing where everybody else was in regard to equine-assisted coaching, because I had no idea what it was. And as mm -hmm. you explained it step by step, and it helped me understand that, but also as you brought in your experience, it helped me understand or begin to understand potential paths I could take to get that into an application form. And then when mm -hmm. I went up for the four days, uh, and actually we did, that's what we did for four days is we got it into the application form. And I was mm -hmm. so grateful for that. but. Pam, I got to tell you this, and it's not because we're in an interview. I say this all the time to people who don't even know you. Uh, the thing that I guess I got the most out of, of all of it, I mean, the knowledge and the experience was great, un mm -hmm. undoubtedly. But your passion and the way you transfer that passion about how horses can help people, because that was brand new to me. You know, mm -hmm. that wasn't the way I was raised with horses. And so... Mm -hmm. Getting that from you and, and finding that that you're very congruent in that area. That's what you feel. That's who you are and your yeah. experience with it. So that was a, a extremely beneficial thing to me was to, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't read this in a book or I didn't get this in college. I got this for yeah. a life with horses combined with my head knowledge. And I have gone out and used it in practice. And so it was, uh, that, that was probably the, the biggest part, all of it was, all of it was meaningful, but that was the biggest part. Yeah. And I think that goes back, you mentioned Ray Hunt and, you know, it's the early pioneers such as Ray Hunt too, that looked at the horse from a different perspective and he had different beliefs about how to connect, you know, and you got to let the horse have their say as well, because I look at the horse as a sentient being, they have feelings, they have emotions. And if we are to connect with them, we have to um, establish that relationship where we need to listen to them to understand where it's not always about the human and what the human wants. Um, so it is going deeper. And that's where I like to bring in some of the deeper components, whatever they are, if you look at science. If you look at psychology, if you look at spirituality, um, and it goes deeper than just the surface, the sub, you know, the surface that we like to see, um, and we got to take time and patience. So, and I think that's a part too that we help uh, the the clients is to learn that connection, patience, you know, paying attention the body language, and the energy. And that's something we don't really talk a lot about is the energy between people. And then, of course, the feel. And there's so much going on. And um, and the horses pick up on all that, right? As you know. So, yeah. So I think, you know, like I could go on and on and on about that. So I want to share a story with you. You, made, you brought it to mind. Uh, when we get into the obstacle course on the first two sessions of that, I am deliberately distracting the boys by giving them directions as they're moving through the obstacles. Now, to go through this, this set of obstacles this way, 
and mm -hmm. and so it gives them a lot of opportunity to lose. It's they have a difficult time. Human beings have a difficult time focusing. These boys yeah. are far into that. They really have a difficult time. Yeah. But I don't know anything I can teach them that is more relevant than that in trying to learn new information and trying to apply new information. And so mm -hmm. the first two passes through, I'm telling them. And of course, every time in the first pass, I don't, I don't stop them. I don't tell them anything. I just let it happen. And they have to, the horse stops and they have to start again. And so in the second pass, when I, when I give them a change and they're adapting to that change I've given them, they stop, they change their thought process and the horse stops. And so I ask them, why do you think the horse stopped? And you know, initially they don't get that. And I say, tell me what your thoughts were just before you realized the horse stopped. I don't ask them about feelings, just thoughts. Sure. Well, I was thinking about what you told me to do. I said, so that did that break your focus, your thought? Yeah. I've had some of the boys that are more astute say, is that the reason the horse stopped? Yeah, that's the reason the horse stopped. Because mm -hmm. in the first early sessions, it's when you look back, if you're leading the horse, the horse will stop. And mm -hmm. so in the third segment of that obstacle course, <laughs> I say, okay, today, now you're going to tell me how you're going to do that, which obstacles you're going to do and how you're going to maneuver. And when you leave here, you just go do that. And of course they do it and the horse doesn't stop. And it's like, you can almost see the wow on their face. Like, wow, that horse really did understand my thoughts. Well, they didn't understand the thoughts, but he understood that he wasn't sure they knew where they were going or how they're going to get there, which, mm -hmm. is a, which is a stop until I can figure out if this is safe or not. And so, uh, yeah, that focus is so, so important. And, and understanding that horses read our energy, they read our emotions, and, they, and, and I believe they read our thoughts. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Ray Hunt and Tom and Bill Dorrance always said, uh, you got to get the feel. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. until I started really studying them the last four, five, six years and trying mm -hmm. to figure out what that was, and I think I have figured it out, I think. And mm -hmm. they'd say, you know, people would say, what are you talking about? Well, I can tell you what it is, but I can't explain to you what it is. Yeah, yeah. I think... Uh, and I got this from Dr. Jacqueline Small here in Austin, Texas. I had a chance to communicate with her after reading her books, all her books. She's retired now. But, uh, uh, and I found her through a book West White wrote, a guy, old, old cowboy recovering out hall out in Arizona that does a class at uh, Marriott Resort out there. And then he led me to Tim Hayes and to another recovering alcoholic. And it, anyway, it was, uh, the horses got him out, got him sober. Uh, but, Wes said he went to one of Dr. Uh, went to one of her, Dr. Small's clinics. And he said, you know, I was listening and it was very interesting. And then she asked a question. Are you a human being in a spiritual experience? Or are you a spiritual being in a human experience? Yeah. Well, when yeah. I read that in Wes's book, it stopped me. But when I yeah. read books about it, the depth yeah. of it, and I think, my ability to understand horses' language and communicate with horses in their language is more about me being a spiritual being in a human experience and them being a spiritual being in an equine experience. And so I think there's a spiritual, and I'm not talking about religion here, I'm talking about spirit, energy, right. spiritual right. connection between, right. there's a possibility of that kind of connection existing between species. And, and I experience that all the time. Uh, and it is, I mean, I can see Ray and, and, and Bill and Tom yeah. trying to figure out how to explain it. They couldn't explain it because they probably didn't understand it. I've had the benefit yeah. of studying some people that do understand it in the yeah. of psychology. And, and, uh, and so it, it is really an interesting phenomenon to me, uh, right. how, how they do that. Yeah. And I think the more you go deeper, you know, learning about the horses and that side of the horses, you know, there's um connections or experiences where you're with your horse or another horse and you're in your own space everything's so quiet and serene and then you experience something like there may be maybe a soft wind that goes through the air and you feel that and the horse is quiet the sun is out or not 
It could be at dusk, you know, it could be in the horizon, you know, when the sun is going down. And all of a sudden the hair starts standing <laughs> on your arms and on your body, you know, it's like electrifying feeling. Yeah. Um, and this is a piece again, so it's so hard to explain and put into words. But I think sometimes this is what a client can also feel. You know, we're talking about energy and they feel that energy and they know there's something there, but we can't articulate it. And but that's that magical piece. That's the mystery side of things. And so when we put the clients, you know, with the horses and if you're outside in nature, you know, because we're four generations removed from nature. But when you bring them into nature, it, you know, and you're with the horses and they're a part of nature, they live in nature. And then, you know, combined with, you know, like you said, the skill set that you're teaching, I have never found anything else that is more beneficial um, at such a fast rate as well to help a client overcome, work with, learn how to self-regulate, you know, that self-efficacy and also think for themselves, yep. you know, then working with the horses and with, you know, someone such as yourself supporting them in that environment. And again, it sounds as if the administration too is, um, you've got a great administration, um, people there that are, have, you know, the drive to put this all together. So, yeah, it's been a real, it's been a real blessing for me to have a, an administrator out there uh, mm -hmm. who values the program. And yeah. Because of what it's doing, not, not because it's just a program, but what it's doing. Yeah. And, what it's uh, doing. So. We're, I think we're beginning to look, it's getting enough uh, favorable uh, uh, results now that I think they're beginning to look at how we can use this to train staff, staff being the people, the care counselors who are yes. working the boys 24 seven in the dorms. Yes. Leadership. Uh, yeah. Everything. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm excited. I've done a little bit of that with a couple of staff on a voluntary basis, yeah. but it was, uh, it was not with the support of the uh, leadership out there, but now I think it's coming around to where they're looking yeah. at that piece. Another, another piece that I don't know where this goes, Pam. I don't know. I just, I just, mm -hmm. I'm just part of this cycle in the universe. I just go with mm -hmm. it. Things come up, but mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to a couple of Tim Hayes' uh, clinics because I read Tim's book early on in my quest for how can I help people. And uh -huh. Tim, uh, I don't know if you know his story or not. He, he's the author of the book, Riding Home. And yep. advertising executive in New York City. I don't think he'd ever been around a horse. And he yeah. went off to one of uh, West Wyatt's clinics out in Arizona and discovered the horse could help him. Yeah, uh, oh, okay. Continue uh -huh. his recovery. And, and he, he yeah. dropped everything and just started traveling and learning about how horses were helping people. And, and today that's uh -huh. what he does. He's been doing it for a long time. Uh, but uh, at, at the last clinic I went to, which is not too far from me, there's a lady that's been through it. She's a certified equine assistant in learning. I don't know what they call that, but, and she's mm -hmm. got a facility. She wants to help people in her area. And while I was there, there was a, a person with two clients there. And they, they are from uh, a shelter for uh, severely handicapped and abused women. But that's my phrase for it. Mm -hmm. and I watched mm -hmm. these women, these two women, as the clinic was going on. And they were up on the edge of their chairs. And they were just so attentive to what was going on. And I got a chance to talk with them and the director of the center where they are afterwards. And I know... I know there's an opportunity to take what we have learned, we are learning and doing with the boys to an environment like that. So the lady's name mm -hmm. has the facility up there is Linda Shulman. So I'm talking, I'm going to be talking to Linda in the next few days about mm -hmm. coming up and doing a free clinic for yeah. anybody who is in a center where they're trying to figure out if horses can help people. And mm -hmm. so how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, you know, how far this has come, you know, being an early pioneer and seeing it when it was just a seed planted in the ground, you yeah. know, and how one year was 300% growth. Now it's worldwide and uh, it's still growing. Yeah. And I know horse people 
horsemanship people, people that own horses, and we talked a little bit about your old conventional, traditional training, they too are starting to cross that bridge, so to say, and starting to understand that a lot of the training involved with horses, it starts with the person, the human, yeah. um, you know, what the things we've been talking about. So it's, 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 it'll take time, but it's getting there and evolution, you know, horse training too is evolving. Yep. You know, as we've seen, so. I, uh, yeah. You reminded me of the staff people that I have worked with. I start them off by having them view two videos. I won't name the trainers because I could get sued, but one trainer mm -hmm. believes in joining up by making the horse, using the horse's natural instinct to flee. So the horse will move. Yeah, yeah. So the horse will move up. I don't, remember, I don't remember the distance, but they'll move so far and then they will stop and stop and check. Yeah. And the other trainer never asked the horse to move. He's just present and mm -hmm. the horse is moving, but finally the horse figures out that, you know, I'm the one that's causing all the problems for me. That guy's not causing any problems. So I'm going to go over there and stand by him. And so I asked the staff after, after they viewed those, we come for our first meeting. I'll say, now, you, you, I want you to answer this question as if you were the horse. Which of those two trainers do you want to be trained by? <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it relates to how you treat people and, yeah. and how you treat horses. So you, what yeah. you said made me think about that. Yeah, yeah, you know, there are no bad horse trainers. Uh, there are horse trainers who are trying to get a product out in the shortest amount of time and the most efficient amount of time and the most right. profitable time they can. Unfortunately, right. uh, that doesn't, in most cases, uh, include uh, incorporating the client, the, the human client, into the training to the extent that they understand uh, what's been done and, and and be able to connect with the horse. Went to a clinic with a really high-powered clinician uh, back last year. My daughter-in-law had some tickets and invited us to go, and it was here in Austin, so we went. And uh, we went on a Saturday, and everything was smooth that day. But on Sunday, my daughter-in-law called me and she said, you'll never believe what happened, Dad. On the second day, someone brought a horse. This is what they do on the second days. Brought a horse for the for the clinician to work with. Well, the clinician gave it to his assistant lady and the horse threw her. And I asked my daughter-in-law, why do you think that happened? Well, you know, she probably, you know, I said, I can, I can almost guarantee you that she didn't take time to mm -hmm. adequately connect and bond with that horse before she mm -hmm. stepped in the saddle. She said, I can tell you that, that she didn't. I saw him lead the horse in and hand it to her and she got on it. So I think in many cases, uh, looking back at my own experience, uh, I didn't give the horse enough respect by connecting properly and bonding properly before I asked the horse to partner with me. And as a result, the horse didn't give me any respect either. Uh, so those yeah. end up in bad situations. And so I think that's another thing. We use that with these boys in trying to help them understand space and respect and, and, and all that. I tell them, yeah. every time you go up to a horse, you put your hand out. I don't care if it's the hundredth time. You always put your hand out and let that horse smell. A horse has got a left brain and a right brain. They don't have much for prefrontal cortex, so they can't logically decide who you are. Yeah. They get a little bit of visible contact, but you're not seeing these horses every day like I am. They're not seeing you. But what they can do is they can identify that scent with what they've stored in their brain. If they've stored good experiences with you, respect, then when they smell you, that's going to come back. Yeah. One boy calls it the scent database. So I try to... I try to get them thinking about that because as you have interactions with each other, the way you conduct yourself is going to have an impact on the other person, not only mm -hmm. now, but the next time you meet them and greet them, mm -hmm. so we, you know, it's that, that same thing. So yeah. we deal with the scent database. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, well, this has been awesome. Really, really appreciate your sharing, you know, your life experience and your stories with the horse and the clients and your path, your journey. It's, yeah, 
it's, it's very, very nice hearing what you're doing. Um, if folks are interested in giving you a call or connecting with you, uh, where can they connect with you? What's your contact? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, there is a website out there. I don't, I'm not using it. It's side by side, uh, life, uh, equine assisted coaching, but, uh, or side by side life coaching, I guess. But, uh, my number is, uh, 512-748-3646. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not in a session, I'll answer it. If I'm in a session, leave me a message. I'll get back to you. And okay. uh, my email address is MCW. S as in Sam, E as in Echo, B as in Bravo, at gmail.com. Okay. And well, you are in Texas. Pardon? Texas. You're in the northern part, southern part of Texas? No, central Texas. Central? Central Texas. Uh, we're not, central. yeah, we're Brady, Texas is supposed to be the center of Texas, but we're about 60 miles, uh, I guess, to the southeast of Brady. So we're near Austin, Texas. We're 20, the center is 20, about 22 miles from Austin. Okay. Okay. And on a closing question, I have a curiosity because you're a cowboy, right? Did you watch by chance, watch the series Yellowstone? You know I did until it, until it got to be, to, in my opinion, completely unrealistic. Uh, okay. I, I don't know how to explain it. It just didn't, it didn't uh -huh. happen. It no longer had any uh, meaning or substance for me. So I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't watch it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a, a episode in there where there's branches, uh, you know, in the Western part of the United States. Uh -huh. Um, and of course, Yellowstone is in Montana, but then they sent one of the actors down to 6666, Four sixes, a ranch. Yeah. Four sixes. That's about, yeah. a hundred, that's about 105 miles from where I live. Oh, okay. So there's a ranch. Six, yeah, six, North six, Babylon, six. Texas, yeah. Yeah. Well, and then a, the quite a place up there. I, I've known, uh, in fact, the ferry that does our horses out at the center, uh, when he was learning to be a farrier, apprenticed under a guy that had the account out at uh, one of the accounts, there's many of them, there are many farriers out there, but uh, they did the mares. And uh, he said they would start, each of them would start at opposite ends of the barn and they would meet at noon on one side. And then oh. once they'd do the same thing and meet on the other side. Yeah, oh wow. So they have a lot of horses at the four sixes and they have some unbelievable horses at the four sixes. Mm -hmm. I see them. They just, uh, they've been competing uh, more, I think, than in the past. They've been competing in uh, the rodeos here in Texas and uh, their teams have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I guess uh, the producer, Taylor Sheridan, Taylor right. Sheridan, the producer's name, supposedly he wrote the stories and the storylines and all that. And he said, where they say he did a lot of research, but um, I guess they used a lot of his horses. And in the series, you know, they showed a lot of reining, roping, spinning, you know, with his horses. So, and uh, that would make sense, yeah. you know, because look at Texas and Oklahoma as the Mecca for horses, you know, horse, horse training, horsemanship. And you may know this, but Ray Hunt used to go there every spring and, uh, mm -hmm. and direct the cult starting of the, you know, the, the cowboys would round up their Bermuda and uh, select out their horses, their, their yearlings. They started all their horses as two-year-olds. <clears throat> they didn't put them to work until they were three and most of them four, most of them four or five. But, uh -huh. uh, but they would start them and, and, and they brought Ray Hunt in just to teach the new technique. I didn't know that until recently. I mean, until the last few years. That uh -huh. He was that respected in that, in that level of ranching. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, because yeah, so. yeah, they take that seriously. <laughs> yeah. But you know, so. if you think about it, a horse knows everything we want them to do. And in training, mm -hmm. we really are teaching them to do it on our cue. And uh, that, mm -hmm. that, that, is, that takes a real, I mean, that's a real piece of work. That's once you get a saddle on them and get them where you can start training them. But uh, yeah. uh, they know what they're, they know how to do all the moves. 
It's just yeah. they, don't know how, they don't know when we're what we're asking for. And so yeah. You see horses that are trained uh, on ranches like the four sixes. Those horses really do know. I mean, they really respond to cues, and and you can see the softness in them that they've been trained right. Ah, uh, yeah, very good. Yeah, well, it's been an honor, and it's been wonderful talking with you again. And uh, yeah, we'll have to stay connected, and uh, you know, let us know what's going on in your world, and uh, yeah. That that uh, networking piece, I think, is so important too. So, yeah. So, thank you very much, Marvin. Thank you. And